Hello! Cool Man 9 with... Angel Ren 89 Yes, because my current living conditions places me within a very short distance of her, so... It's doing... pretty cool. Yeah. Alright, so we're going to do a little talk about Shaolin... That, that'll be for another time. That other show. Uh, probably tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. But first, before we kind of get into that, so we can make some people understand, especially a certain person. I remember one time who left hate mail on my ass box because of I was really, really angry with that other show. Shaolin Chronicles. Make you understand where we come from. So we're first going to obviously talk about something that we love. So here's a positive thing. Shaolin Showdown. Yeah. Shaolin Showdown. Gongi Tampai. <laughs> Alright. Okay. You go first. Okay. So, fun story. So, originally, Solid Showdown, I did not watch it when it first aired. I, I, I did watch it when it first aired. I watched maybe, on uh, the top of my head, I think maybe six episodes out of the entire three seasons when it first aired. Because I there was other things I was obsessed with. But it seemed like a fun thing. But I did have friends who really, really loved it. So, I remember a couple years later, I think... Because I was in middle school, I believe I was in 8th grade, when it was like, I think I was in 8th grade or that, or I was a freshman. It was um, do, airing reruns on Cartoon Network. And that's when I got to finally see more episodes, because those were their house, there was like a marathon of it. And I saw most of the episodes, but I still did miss some, because like, it was like a sleepover thing, and I sometimes left the room to go play video games in the other room with like some other, like one of our other friends, and there was like Smash Brothers. And it Smash happens. <laughs> so, mm. um... But it was like, that was that. And and then I get to college, years, years later. And just like with Avatar The Last Airbender, because this is funny, I kind of have yeah. this parallel thing with both Showdown and Avatar The Last Airbender and Korra and Chronicles. Um, it's, it's a funny thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm in college. I was having a rough time. Like, I, me in college. It was rough, 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 rough. And... Book one of Korra ended, and I knew book two was coming up soon, and, but I was just like, eh, I was just in a meh, like, I was not enthusiastic about it. And then I remember one person, I don't know, it was on some other website, I think, because people were talking about some of their favorite cartoons of the millennium, like, from, like, Batman Beyond to, like, Justice League, like, all those came possible... Teen Titans, all those that aired in early 2000s. And Avatar, Last Amber, all those people were all talking about those cartoons. And somebody mentioned Shallon Showdown. And I was like, oh yeah, that show was kind of fun. But like, I didn't like <laughs> grow up with it. It was my childhood. Neither was Avatar, The Last Airbender. They were just, they were my middle school, high school years, like, and stuff. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, where was I? Oh, right. So I'm in college and. Disappointment with Cora. I was like, meh. And I was on this message board. And then somebody mentioned, like, I didn't know anything. Somebody mentioned to me, like, saying that Showdown is, there's going to be another show called Shaolin Chronicles. And mm. I didn't know any information besides that. That was all I knew. Just, like, just those words. And I was like, oh, cool. And someone says, we don't know when it's going to air, but I think it's going to air at some point this year. And so I was like, you know? I was like... I'm having a rough time at school right now. I don't care much for Cora right now, mm -hmm. and it's not even on, like, because it was, like, in between the period of book one and book two. And I was like, you know what? Why don't I? Because I found out they had all the episodes of Showdown on YouTube, and I'm like, let's just watch something. And I was like, because I remember the show being fun. And then that's when my love hit me. <laughs> it was not when I was younger. It was when I was in college watching this show. But I, I guess because it, I was having a rough time, and they were just... This fun, fun thing was just in front of me, and I just ate up every moment of it. I was having a blast. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I just fell huge in love with it, obsessed with it, gone crazy over it. Now I'm writing a fanfic for it. Yes. <laughs> just, ah, I just gone goo goo gaga. Over and you also it. did a, a two shot. Yeah, a thing, and then, like, another one. On and I just... She's obsessed. I'm obsessed! <laughs> and I just, I remember writing one post, and he reblogged it, yeah. and another friend liked it, 
And but as soon as like he reblogged it, I was just like, "You watched Showdown? Cause I now love it." And then like this girl liked it, and I was like, "You watched it?" So now like she's like rewatching it, like or she had rewatched it. And then at what, some point with uh, Karina, I was just like, "Hey." I was like, you liked Teen Titans, didn't you? She's mm -hmm. like, yeah, I loved it. And I was like, I have a show I think I know you like. <laughs> so yeah. she has now watched it all. And now I dragged her down with me. I tend to do this to people. Yeah, drag them an, down into my fandom. She's an expert in this. But I got to do I got to do that with Attack on Titan. You yeah, show. yeah. You did that to me. And now my life is ruined. <laughs> but, but it's okay. We care more about shipping in the show than the story. Well, I care about the characters most of me all. Me too. Okay. Anyways, right. so... Hey, all right, yeah. So I actually watched Shaolin Showdown back when it aired when I was in, I know I was in middle school because I remember, um, I remember because I was at a Taekwondo tournament. I just started uh, that, I started that in middle school. So uh, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. But yeah, I remember uh, I watched the show. I mean, I, of course, I, you know, when you're a kid and you're watching this, you don't really remember every episode and stuff, but you did. But, um, because I remember talking about the finale with a friend, and sadly, I didn't realize that was the series finale, so I was oh. kind of disappointed after, you see, after Raimundo becomes the leader, and then they go out and fight all the villains. So like, excited. And that, that's it. That's it. But, uh... Dang. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I remember I had a lot of fun memories of the show, and then, then, you know, I loved that post, and I ended up deciding, you know what, I, I kind of want to rewatch the series. And, uh, because I don't really know if I had heard of Chronicles at this point, but it doesn't really matter because so I rewatched the series. It was my fault. <laughs> yeah. So I rewatched the series and then I uh, then I'm like, wow, this show is great because I also had rewatched uh, Teen Titans earlier that year, and then uh, I'm like, all these shows I used to watch, and then like er after a core aired, I watched uh, uh, Avatar: Last Airbender all over again. And I'm like, these shows were brilliant, and I didn't even realize this. Oh yeah. Right. By the way, I also watched Batman the Animated Series again, so I'm just like, that was a nostalgic year for me. That was but, fun. Yeah, um, so, I, uh, I remember, you know, just seeing all this stuff, and I'm just like, wow, there's so many deep stuff in this, and, you know, they just don't do that in cartoons anymore, and I'm just like, what the heck? But, uh, yeah, so, uh... So, yeah, this is our main thing. It wasn't something, like, that we grew up with as children. And, I, I, I kind of did grow up with Well, a little bit, but it's like, it's not quite nostalgia goggle, so our next... Yeah, because we, we didn't even remember much of it. Our next video, you will cool. need to understand for our standpoint, but let's keep on with the positive. So instead, let's start talking about, let's start with talking about some of our favorite things. Like, let's just go down. Um, why don't you just go in, like, just for the most part, talk about little different things about your the four main mm -hmm. characters and then Fung Dojo oh. and any of the other character villains, like, whatever. Yeah. Like, yeah. you can start. Yeah. Like, go. So, well, uh, with the Shaolin Showdown, one thing that really kind of, I mean, you know, you, you can really tell so there are certain shows back then that they actually gave it, I mean, of course, you know, them being kid shows, they were always slightly more comedic than, you know, you would see in a, a, a drama than you would see in, like... Well, this is a Joss Whedon show. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That sass saying. meter is just off the chart. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> but a lot of these older shows, I mean, in Shaolin Showdown especially, it actually gave a crap about uh, having well-written characters and well-written story arcs, for the most part, until executive meddling jumps in. Well, it, it did have its plot holes, and it's funny. I almost, like, had a, like, I was literally like, okay, I'm going to rewatch Shaolin Showdown again, and then just start picking apart all the plot holes and things that bothered me. Most of them would be stuff in season three because that was the weakest season. And then I yeah, started that, watching Chronicles and I'm like, you know what? Showdown that, could do worse. I don't think I need to do this post anymore. Suddenly I could forgive Showdown for all these things. Yeah. So I guess there's one positive thing yeah, Chronicles did. Another thing like, with Avatar, like with Avatar and the Last Airbender, of, the show had its faults. And yeah, it, had, it, it was, had it was its the weak, same thing with it, Korra. It had its weak episodes, but then you see Korra and you're just like... And then suddenly I can forgive the faults. So I'm like, you I, know, it could do worse. It could do worse. I'd rather watch The Great Divide 12 times than oh rewatch Korra. <laughs> <laughs> but uh so yeah i mean it's one of the crazy things with showdown and uh and uh one thing that you know, i did love is that there's a lot of like different layers of it especially with characters like jack and i i almost did a post about this and i just kind of never got to it was a boat like talking about how jack is like you know there is such a strong argument that jack isn't actually evil he just is pressured to be evil and he feels like that's the only thing he's good at any good at 
And it's just, I mean, oh, that, that's pretty much what happened in the episode when he turned good. Yeah, it? The Apprentice. That was such a good episode. Oh, and especially I had one of my favorite uh, Shaolin showdowns. And I got that ask that I finally answered. Yeah. That, that was the first one on the list was the Truth or Lie showdown with, between Omi and Jack. It was a good one. It wasn't fighting or anything. It was just Asking a character what? moment. Yeah. And Huge it, character moment. And it wasn't just a character moment with Jack. It was also a character moment for Omi, too. So that's why also that episode was really good. Yeah, and because I know when Omi was asking him questions like, uh, did you did you actually try to turn good? And he's like, no, I tricked you. And then it's like, lie. It's like, it's a lie. You did try. And we're just like, oh. And then it's like, and, and then and Omi's like, did you did you turn evil again? You turned evil again only because you felt like, like you, you, fe you feared that you would fail and good just as you have in evil. And he's like, no. And then it's like, lie. And it's like, he did. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I'm like, that was interesting because of Jack is... Like, okay, yes, he's he's a butt monkey, he's comic relief, and he's lame, and they, but at the same time, it's like, he's not like some character who's like insecure and whines constantly about his insecurities. And it's like, but he tries tell, to cover those up. But you can tell, like, yeah, he tries to hide it behind, like, his attitude and, and all that other stuff, but, oh dear. Yeah, the power's going out. Oh dear. Uh, what do we do? Um, let's probably plug it in. Okay. So... Yeah, so let's try this. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so Jack was, um, he was insecure, but he was just someone you can relate to. I think that's why he's really popular with the fandom. I think a lot of people really resonate with that. Like, they can understand, like, being insecure, but then trying to pretend everything's okay. Yeah. And, you know, one thing I liked is, um, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, with the you know Jack and you know you see parts of him that are not evil. Like you see when he, when the, when he comes out of the yin yang world, and uh, he oh was, he used the reversing mirror, and instead of coming out with the the evil, he was he came out. He was and he, he was out, so good. Like yeah, his good side is actually better of a person than ninety nine percent of the everybody human race. in the cast. He's so good that it freaks out the good guys. Yes. <laughs> and even in the, the alternate timeline, when they get stuck with good Jack, he's so goody two-shoes and high happiness and rainbows. And he, oh, my goodness. And like, and, and like, it freaks out everyone. They wanted evil Jack back. <laughs> like, they're just like, we want our jerk back. <laughs> and it's like, you, you think that he's evil. And it's like, no, because that show actually gave a crap about... Uh, making characters more than one dimension. Even Jack, who I would, I think is one of the, he, he seems in, in, on on the face value like one of the most one dimensional characters in the show, but and he he is more to him than Wuya does. But he's also another thing about Jack is he's not just he's just he's a snarky teenager who does have tens of a child history, but he's just like not over-the-top juvenile like yes he had his juvenile moments and his moments that poked fun at him but it was that, that was more of the base character archetype than what he actually but, but was. it was it was yeah it was like but it he was still he was just more just a childish teenage boy which like you know like people can get like oh like a teenage boy they do something like that yeah. only except this one builds robotics and wants to take over the world <laughs> And, and you can also find, and uh, also there's one in the Truth or Lie showdown, uh, Omi asked him if he only wanted world domination to, to prove himself because he has low self-esteem, and it turns out that that was true, and you're just like, Jack, no, Jack. <laughs> and it's like, you're not evil. And if, and you know, and if Chris, Christy Hui, or Hui, Hui, Hui had her way, Jack would have turned good in the third season. Yeah, she had originally a plan that Jack was going to become part of the all right, yeah, the battery died. So I think we were talking about Jack. We were originally talking about Jack. Yeah, hello, but, dog. My dog's in the room. I went back to the wood bar. All right, let's try to let's try to do this thing. Yeah, before it flips out again. Yeah, we haven't, we've been kind of since the thing. Oh yeah, if you're if you're wondering where her glasses went oh, or her sunglasses, oh. <laughs> uh, she thought about Chronicles and literally smashed them. It was on my head, and I was like, did this because I was telling of a thing that happened in the newest episode, and I was so mad, and I I smacked my head. And, I, I, I broke my glasses. <laughs> you wouldn't like her when she's angry. My poor glasses. <laughs> Whole barren. <laughs> well, uh, when I do rant, my friend Amy did dub it as release the Kraken, and that was our running joke with mm. each other. I, yeah. I released the Kraken on these poor things. Yeah, we're, and we're going to release the Kraken on uh, Chronicles when tomorrow. We, tomorrow. <laughs> so I think we're going to try to watch a couple episodes. Yeah, tonight. 
Yeah. We're going to play a fun game, too. <laughs> because if you're going to watch something you hate, you at least have to do it with somebody you hate with and play a game while doing it. Yes. And we're totally going to be tallying every time we do this stuff, too. Take a shot. Yeah, well, I don't drink alcohol. It's gonna Neither be, do I. Like, it's going to be, like, when me and my friend, we play, because we, like, watch Nostalgia Critic. So me and my friend Mackenzie always, we have a drinking game. But it's usually with soda or water, and the game is pretty much, like, how long, like, you can last until, like, you have to go to the bathroom. Take a shot. Like, like whoever, like, ends up having to go first, uh, they lose. That's yeah. the whole thing. So it's like, who can last the longest without having to go to the bathroom? Yeah, so we're pretty much going to be taking a shot, but probably with, like, water or something. Yeah, yeah. but um, one of the... I think but, we, we needed to talk about when about when we first heard about Chronicles. And right. when all, there, our first experience and impressions from the show before we watched it. Oh, okay. Well, we'll get to that, but first let's talk a couple more about, because we were talking about Jack. We were oh, talking right. about yeah, we, characters yeah. we love. We'll try to, because yeah. it was bad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jack, I mean, we were talking about how he had multiple layers, and we were actually continued the conversation uh, after the camera went off, so I don't remember exactly what, what happened, but I think we just get to the point is that Jack, even though he was childish oftentimes and rather immature, he actually had a character that you could actually look at and say, there's this part of his character, and you know, there's the deeper part, there's the part that actually had a, he had a very touching relate, uh, sort of mother-son relationship with Wuya. It was really funny, like, um, yeah. it was, it wasn't, I wouldn't use quite the word touching, but at the same time, it, it, well, it's interesting. Yeah, like, I mean, there, there, there was one uh, episode where Wuya, I think Wuya had just left him to go to Chase. Yeah. And he has a picture of him and Wuya. And he's like, like he took a picture with her and he framed it. Like, that says something about Jack's character. Yeah, like, he actually liked having her around despite the fact that these two yeah. bicker and say mean things to each other. He yeah. obviously liked having her around. Yeah, and then when he uh, and then he throws it out in there and he's just like, and that's, that's him trying to be immature because he can't, because he actually doesn't like facing how he feels, which is, Jack, why? No, Jack. <laughs> and they kind of do poke fun at the fact that she's obviously a lot older than like that one, like, comment in the one episode where he's just like, <laughs> how come we don't have a relationship like that? I'm not your mommy. Now pick up your toys, Jackie. We're going home. Like, yeah. I, I thought that was really funny. Yeah. That was just like... <laughs> yeah, there was even an episode in, um, I think it was the uh, Treasure of the Blind Swords. Yeah, episode. it was uh, season so, three. Yeah, that, so that she, she, so she comes back to him and she's like, it's like, Chase isn't in charge of me, and uh, he thinks I'm out with the girls. <laughs> yeah, he's just like, I'm, I'm having a sleepover with some evil friends. Yeah. It's like, what evil friends do you have, Louie? Yeah, the only other uh, person you interacted with was either Cat Nappy or Jack. So Chase yeah. thinks you're with Cat Nappy, yeah. and you're obviously with Jack. Yeah, and when I was watching the rewatching a, a showdown, and I actually took a screenshot of the one they're on the train, and I said, it's funny that, you know, no matter how much they bicker, they always end up coming back but to each other. But they do, and it's funny, because how she'll, like, she will insult him and put him down constantly. And yet, who does she go to to go on this little treasure quest? Jack! Jack! <laughs> it's, like, it's like, you're not fooling anybody, will you? Some part of you actually enjoys his company. I actually uh, found a, he a headcanon from the Shaolin Chronicle, or Shaolin Chud on Headcanon's Tumblr, yeah. saying that Jack is actually Wuya's descendant from... That actually would be really interesting. Yeah. They are from... both redheads. Yeah, and it's like... And uh, the markings on the eye. It's like, you know, well, I think that's more makeup on Jack. Because yeah. at one point when you see him wet, you see it's like red yeah. in his face. Wooly is wet. You never see that. That's like yeah. any actual markings. Yeah, but it's like, you know, so it's, that's funny because you somehow they, they say that that's how, like it's on his dad's side and that's how we ended up with the puzzle box. Like probably, which yeah. like that would be actually kind of cool if that know, was true. If that if they came in real, that would actually be awesome. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's like you see, and it's like all these different characters have. Uh, different relationships, and there there's such a varying amount of relationships between the characters. You have the the sort of mother son relationship between Jack and Wuya. You have the pseudo maybe romantic thing between Wuya and Chase. That it's the oh, word to, word, word, pseudo. Word, Are you kidding? <laughs> that eye sex they had and the U.S. And the freaking <laughs> we're, line were just we're, we're just staying together yeah, for the right. sake of evil. I'm just like they looked at each other with like that smile, like yeah, we're banging. I was just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> they got this. Like this is a kid show. Like what the heck? I'm just like he depowered her, and, she, and but yet he he still needs her around because she's a worthy partner in evil. And it's like okay, but you don't well, see I mean, him making her do his bidding a lot. And I'm like. Besides, obviously, like that, doing some stuff with her, like you oh. know, where they go off and hunt stuff, and because she's a powerful lady and all this yeah, stuff. I mean, Even when he depowered her, what other reason would you keep a woman who looks like that around? Like, <laughs> like come on, 
she's sex on legs and like he's like the charismatic guy, they were doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we kind of ship it if you can't tell. I uh, don't ever ship anything for the lulls of it. She shipped it as a joke at first. I guess I kind of shipped it as a joke at first too, and then and then at the ask Chuya. And then I just find this blog and they had all these head cannons. So I'm like, and I can actually see him doing that. Then I'm like, oh no, I think I'm. I can actually shipping. see them doing that. It's like, crap. <laughs> Starting to ship it. Yeah, yeah, and uh, then. Uh, but some, it's funny because some people are saying, "Oh, not again, battery." Yeah, let's try to finish this. <laughs> okay, some people were saying like, "Oh, Julia is a bad pairing. Like, why would you want that? Like, they betray each other. They do stuff that they're, they're villains. Evil. That's the whole point. That's part of their appeal. They're evil. That's, yes. Like that's why I like it. They're yeah. gleefully evil and they do evil yeah. things and they're even just like, yeah, we have our problems, but yeah. We're, we're making just, it work. <laughs> they're, we're still begging. That's pretty much what they're saying. It's just like, my gosh. Yeah. Like, just yeah. tone it down. But yeah. there's young kids watching the show. Gosh dang it, you two. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, well, the you have the friendship between the four main characters, the brother uh, really, brotherly relationship that Omi had with uh, Br Oh, Clay and Raimundo, Raimundo especially, oh, and his goodness. sisterly so relationship with uh, Kimiko, yeah. and then the ship teasing between Kimiko and uh, Raimundo, which is canon. I have proven this on Tumblr. If you check my Raikim tag on Tumblr, I have, I have posted screenshots of all the moments like when Kimiko was in Raimundo's dreams. I'm, I'm sorry, you do not do. This. Well, like canically, at the very she, she's least, kissed, she's kissed him on the cheek twice. I mean, okay, you can try to make an argument. Maybe Kimiko doesn't feel that way about. But I was like, but canically, a boy doesn't have dreams about girls like that where they're like, oh, oh my goodness, she's so pretty. Like, unless he's into her. And she and she uh, she kissed him twice. And I don't uh, think well, a girl would kiss a boy, like, well, unless she's flirting. Especially at that age. Like, but, like they're teenagers. They're about the same age. Well, and heck, heck and the the final episode when uh when he makes a leader. Uh, what was the leader called? And he actually Shoku. She, he makes Shoku, and she she goes up kisses on his cheek, and he's still holding her. Well, they're Oh, no, like, you, you don't. You don't. See, just that's do the that. other thing with Chase and Wuya. You see a lot of scenes where she's like on him, like constantly. And even though he's like, and he's like, even that, like that jokingly, where he's like three second rule, and you can tell like he's not a person that likes to touch. He'll let her hang off him constantly, like whatever. And it's just like they're so touchy feeling. It's like weird, like. And this, and this, and this is pretty much the um, American equivalent of a um, a shonen. Oh, so yeah. so yeah so they're getting more touchy feely than a show than any shonen anime will ever get. Oh, man. And it's like <laughs> it's so blatant. It's so blatant. And we're back again because so battery problems. We I think we charged it enough this time. Yes. So character relationships. I believe that's where we were. I don't know. It's been a it's been an hour or so. Well, I remember us last leaving off when we were talking about uh, the character relationship, and I brought it back. Chewy and. Jeez, those two. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's been an hour, but then the feels. <laughs> I remember that. So, yeah. Yeah, and because then I was trying to hurry up and talk about the other ones. And we were talking about Omi's relationship with each of the... The, the dragons. So, yeah, okay. Oh, man. What I love about these characters is how... They set up stereotypes where in any other show, they could just be superficial stereotypes and even take it to the point where it could start to get offensive. And, and to just tell you, we're both born raised Texans. Oh, yeah. So, you know, when we first, both of us first saw Clay, we were like... I literally was like, ah, uh, oh, not another cowboy stereotype. Yeah, I'm and sick of it. I'm yeah, so sick of it. And it's like, and you it's know, always the dumb cowboy who lives on a farm is like, oh, my I'm God. so conservative, and I hate anyone who's different. And oh, just, this whole dumb thing. But he wasn't like that at no. all. He was like the nicest human being, and he was actually a lot smarter than he appeared. That was the other really interesting thing. Even wow, though, a triple sow cow. What a cowboy can't like figure skating. Or it was like. Um, with the spiders, like they desiccate them, suck them dry until nothing is left. What cowboy can't have a hobby? <laughs> they're just like there's just there's more to him than that. Or what, like how he knew like this scientific name for like a dolphin. I can't even remember what it was. Like because and he, he like when everyone looks at him, he's like what bottomless dolphin. But I'm just yeah. like that was a nice little running gag because even though it was like a joke, like oh Clay is actually smarter than he appears, that reveals more to him than that. Like he's smarter yeah. than he appears to be. Not to mention the the dynamics he had with his family between his the 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 the, the, the rivalry uh, between him and his sister. And, I really uh, loved it because of growing up, I come from a big family, 
And so, you know what it's like, because there's one thing I always remember my mother saying. She's like, you never know, because like, sometimes you'll think, oh, you only, you only get after me. Why don't you get after, like, whatever sibling? My mom's just like, you don't hear me talking to your other siblings. And that really could kind of sum up, like, because I'm sure Jesse only saw any form of praise that was given to Clay. Because, like, if she, like, really noticed, because if you know the episode before, like, when it had family problems, he did have issues with his dad. And oh, it was yeah. like, like yeah, so she probably only saw any good praise. So <laughs> she didn't see that there actually can be issues, like, when she's not around and not realizing it. And I just thought, like, that's realistic. And, and she was portrayed a little more realistically, and I just kind of liked their relationship. And, and, she, and even though she was actually a bad guy, she... You can definitely tell that she was more than just the evil sister. Oh, yeah, and you could tell like there was more depth to her, and deep down, she still cared about her brother. Yeah, I think I think I think I love the ending. Yeah, the it ending was like was it's really like good. it's like and she made one concession. What? She got to keep one Shang Kong Wu, and it's like the wings of Tanabi, and I'm like hell yeah, if I get to choose one, I'd be like flying around with rainbow jet streams and on her motorcycle. <laughs> on her motorcycle. <laughs> Like it was, it was, it was really good. It was really well handled the situation with yeah. his family, and I loved. Um, I just loved Kimiko's character. Like I, mm. when I first watched the show, those two were my favorite, Clay and Kimiko. Yeah. Because I just loved the little character moments like between them, like and uh, Kimiko, like how it was like you can't do this because you're a girl. And like it was like no, far from it. Like even Clay, she's like, what? It's because I'm a girl. And he's like, because you're a hothead. Yeah, I love that. I love that moment because then because. You know, they, they always set up the whole... Like, oh, girls can do anything. Yeah. A man can do it. And you like, I've been beaten to death with this. Like, I'm a girl. I know I can mm -hmm. do anything a guy can do. It's like, I'm like, okay, can we and it's on do the, something new with it? It's, do a new spin with it's it? On an, it's not a, a criticism of her gender. It's a criticism of her personality, which Kimiko... I mean, I think they had entire episodes about her being a hothead. And making mistakes. I think one of my favorite part was... The Evil Within, even though there was the whole the other subplot yeah. going on, that was one of my favorite parts of the episode, which you know. <laughs> but yeah. I love it because of the exploration of Kimiko's character. Because of how it was like how she made a mistake and she was afraid to admit it because she just didn't want to be wrong. And then it comes around where she realized just be and I think my favorite line one of my favorite lines from her is it's actually one of my top like favorite showdowns is Kimiko versus Sabini because her line right before she fixed everything, she said, just because I made a mistake doesn't mean I can't fix it. And I was like, and that's, like, it's one line, but that's a great message to send to kids. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, kids, you're going to make mistakes, but guess what? You can fix it. It's like, there's nothing wrong with admitting it. And I like the line from Fung where he's like, it's like, making a mistake is not a sign of weakness, Kimiko. It's um, not admitting it that is the true mistake. Yeah. I also like the relationship he had with her dad, which was Satoru Iwata. It was, it was so cute. Yeah, they were, and it's they like, were cute. he was like, she spoiled her rotten, and she was just like, and it's like, and you know, you're and like. You can tell they adored each other. Yeah, yeah, and it's a, and you know. She had a good relationship with her dad. And, and I always love calling her dad Satoru Iwata, because he know. looks just like Satoru Iwata. He totally Iwata. does, he totally <laughs> does. And, uh, like, we talked a bit about, like, I don't know if we did, okay, maybe that was, off camera that we talked a bit yeah. about Raymundo actually because blip things. Okay, um, okay, I will admit he's not my absolute number one favorite, but I love Raymundo's character development. Mm. What good he, writing! He's kind of the Zuko of the show in a way. In a way, if, if Zuko was was started off good. Yeah, it's like he had his like really good like story arc of him coming around because he starts off as this really lazy boy who just wants the easy way out constantly and just would rather have things just his way. And man, does he come around to the end. Like, oh my gosh, that was just such great character development. And I love, one of my favorite things is, even though there's another relationship between two characters, that is my absolute favorite in the show, <laughs> the one thing I think that is the main focus of the show that you will see constantly that has more focus than any other relationship is the friendship between Omi and Raymundo. Like, you constantly see it present. Even, it's even there subtly in each season finale. But we're, we're, it's more, a little bit more focused in the very final season yeah. finale, in season three. But you can see it there subtly in the first season finale and in the second one, too. 
Like in the first one, like even though it was kind of partially a comic re relief moment where Omi's just like, hee hee, secret, elaborate plan. And like, but that said something about oh. Omi's character, about how he really could True. not believe that Raymundo would betray him. That shows Omi had a lot of faith in Raymundo, that, oh, that yeah. he's actually a good guy at heart. Like it was a small moment, but I was like, oh, that's actually really sweet that he actually like, okay, yeah. And whenever he's like, when you see him so heartbroken, like, Raimundo has betrayed us, and he's like, looks like he's about to cry, and I'm just like, oh, oh my god, oh, that's me, so baby, no. Sad. Yeah, that, that's what I'm like. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly me. <laughs> but I was like, oh, but it's like it, that really says something about them, and um, and even and despite the fact that Omi definitely had an inferiority complex. Oh, to Ray totally Mundo, did. He says but that they still had a they had a very brotherly relationship, um, and like in the season two finale, whenever. Um, he has to fight evil Omi, and um, you just see like that one moment where he just sheds a single tear. Or and, like, and when as, they as, to as they're, they're, they're flying away, they, 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 have, they have to drag Raimundo. They have to leave him behind, which is really funny because you it says something about each of their characters if you watch them. I even like did a little, I reblogged this like one gift set that had the two times Raimundo cried. Um, and I had to comment on it because the second one is where you see Clay, he doesn't even look back, he just hangs his head down in shame. And uh, you see Kimiko, she is looking back, but then you see her face wince, and then she turns away. Like, she can't even look. And so, but, it's like, but then you see Raymundo. Not only does he tear up, but he, he can't turn away. He keeps his eyes on Omi the entire time as they fly away and have to leave him behind. I'm just like, ow, ow, my heart. <laughs> just like, oh my gosh. Like, they have, like, even though they fight and they have this rivalry they're very much like brothers i can't remember where it was said but i'm pretty sure somewhere in the series it said like either he's like the oldest of five or he's got like five younger siblings it was something like that yeah and so i was like obviously i think i think that was that mentioned in the episode and they all got presents or something i think so but and it was the talking about the families and um so even though we never get to see ray mundo's family mm. Um, it really kind of will say something about Raymundo because he treats Omi very much like an older brother would treat a little brother. I would know. I got an older brother and a little brother. It's like, yeah, I have an older sister and a little sister too. Big family, but um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I can see like that. Like that's exactly what older siblings and little siblings are like. They're exactly like that. Like there's the teasing, but they're still very close and. It's just, it's a very sweet relationship, and it's very ever-present, and their character development is actually kind of tied together at the same time, because they, there's a growth that they each go through, so they're obviously the two. But, but that they both become more mature, because Raimundo started off as, imminent, and as an immature my way or the highway uh, punk, and then Omi was... And he grew to be more air. He was he arrogant. He was arrogant, and he was egotistical and insecure, and... But then you just kind of see, like, Omi gets more humble, and Raimundo gets more mature and steps up. And uh, it was just, I think, like, there's such a poignant moment whenever Omi, like, even though he kind of was really sad because he really wanted to be a leader so bad, he's like, but he just smiles and bows to Raimundo. And I'm yeah. just like, and Raimundo just smiles, and, like, they just give each other respect. And I'm like, ah, that was such a great, 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 great moment. I loved it to death. It was so awesome. And I love I love the villains in the show. I love mm, the characters. Yeah. Their villains are so great. Okay, Hannibal Raven was kind of lame. Well, but I actually you know what I, I think uh, one of the few people in the entire universe that actually likes I don't, Hannibal Raven. I don't I don't hate him. I think it's mostly his character would have been so much cooler if he had a different design. I don't know. For some reason I just find it hard to take him seriously and a lot of it feels very informed. Like, because they're always like, oh, he's the evilest evil thing. Now, granted, he that's was, more... He was the guy who turned Chase evil. Yeah, but granted, it's like, it's kind of executive meddling's fault. Because there was, you could tell the story was trying to build up something. And, sh like, there was probably a grand scheme that Hamble Ray even had. But because of executive meddling, they never got the chance to get yeah. around to it. Yeah. So we would have seen... Hannibal probably live up to that title, but we never got the chance to. That's why I feel like he's kind of the weakest of the villains. Yeah, but, he is the weakest in... Like, in, in oh. writing. Yeah. Like, um, but... But even then, like he still has, like he's just like he's I, the evil. I, I think of the I think evil. I think he's uh like he I think of all the uh, of all the bad guys, he's the only one I would describe as a right bastard. Oh because, yeah, he is definitely that. So. Because you know, I mean, of the on the evil, you have Jack, who's definitely a, you consider a starter he, villain, and he's a he's the more comic relief. He's the, the Team he, Rocket, basically. Yeah, and he and you know, and they're 
a lot of ways that you could actually see that Jack isn't, you know, he's not evil. You have Wuya, who's extremely powerful and evil, and she's just like, evil. and she's like, girls just want to have fun, kind of a. But but she's like very gleefully evil, but and so and then, she's basically like, you know, like the uh, vain, like the vain, like. Uh, she's kind of like Jesse from Team Rocket. Yeah, but she's the very vain, but somebody who's a witch with reality warping powers. So. Yes, is, and it's telling that. The only way that Chase can control her is to uh, cap her powers when he transforms that, that, her back. But that's, in a way, almost a high compliment to her. So saying that Chase is actually worried about her being at full power. Yes, because you, know, I mean, you remember in the end of at the season finale of, uh, of season one, it's like the second she uh, came back, it would... Boom! The instantly Everything. the world was under her control. So Instantly. like So she is... Probably one of the most powerful. She probably could. There's a reason why uh, even even um, uh, Dashi had trouble with her. And it's like I can imagine though. The people are like, well, why didn't that happen with Dashi? I'm wondering though if like this is just my theory that it's probably because of Dashi's presence because he might have been somebody who's equal in power to her that it didn't quite happen. Like they cancel each other out probably. Yeah, and then the, he knew that the only way to st like you know stop her would be to trap her, and that's when he put her in the puzzle box. Yeah. And and then we get to my favorite villain, our favorite our villain. Our favorite villain, Chase Young. Oh my god, he's the David Xanatos of this series. He's so cool. Yes, you know, and I, I absolutely love He's love very charismatic. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he's very charismatic. And that's one thing I love. I love, like, honorable villains. The guys who, no, they could have killed you, like, the second they met you. But they're going to respect that. They honor that. They said they wouldn't do that. Like they have some sort of honor code. Any type of villain that has some sort of honor code. Like maybe they're a type that they won't hurt children. Or they won't hurt women. Or like they won't attack an unarmed opponent. Or yeah. like they'll, they'll have something like that. That's a, like a code of honor of some sort. Or like whatever it is. And uh, mm. Chase is that he always keeps his word. Just like Omi. Like they always, always keep their word. Yeah, because even in the the fight, the time when he fought, um, it was I think it was Master Monk Guan's yeah. first episode. Oh, that was such an and awesome they fight. Had that was a, both their first episode. Yes, that was an amazing. They fight. had a classic showdown, not a Shaolin showdown. It was. It was. I think that's one of my favorite fight scenes ever. It was so well choreographed, and you just got to see these two powerhouses. Yeah, and especially when he especially he he beats him by just blasting him through all the things, and you know after they beat him, he uh, chases like. All right. Because like won. they had all these like cats, like like his whole entire like legion of guys. They were like all coming out and, and he, rallying. He's like, no. And even Jack is like, yeah, we can still stop him. And Chase is like, no, I accepted their challenge and lost. They're free to go. Yes, oh, I just like, that was like, dude, he's like so cool. He's cool. Yes. Not to mention, uh, he's also one of those. He's also just an intelligent villain. Oh yeah, I love smart villains. Not the ones that are like so in your face, like that it's annoying. Like if you're, <coughs> if you're light, you got know I me. Mean. Like, yeah, like like light, you got know I me. Mean. Like uh oh. Albert West. Yeah, you know, I don't know if you're into the Resident Evil series, but I love Albert Wesker. At least until Resident Evil Five derailed him, because Albert Wesker, you know, he starts off in the first game. It's just, I mean, originally he was just sort of the weenie guy who tried to do anything and ended up getting killed. Then they basically, then uh, the game, the a game, a couple games after that, they uh, they uh, retconned it to the, how he had actually planned with William Birkin to take a serum that after he was ah. killed and he faked his death, he would turn him into a super soldier. And then, and then he was basically just manipulating things from the background. And like in Code Veronica, when we, they revealed that, it was like all the things were crashing down. And instead of fighting uh, Chris Redfield, he goes, okay, bye, and then leaves. And then you're like, and then Resident Evil 4, he's just behind the scenes. And you're like, I just love that because he's smart. And he's like, yeah, you know what? I could fight you now, and I'd probably end up losing because I'm injured. So, yeah, I'll see you later. And it's like... You just you get those smart villains. It's who... hard to describe because there's some mm. like okay, like there's this one villain in Bleach. I'm not going to say who because of like it's like a really cool important thing. And he needs to like because that was like the the Soul Society arc was like the best thing, <laughs> it's my favorite arc, and uh, like that's when this villain appears. It's like and then he was okay, but then after that, he was so like villain too. Like I'm like it. It just it even mm. though it was like I'm four steps ahead of everybody, it, it felt so phoned in. And it's it's like kind of hard to describe like how like I can hate villains like that or villains like Snizel. 
Yeah. And it's like, but I can love villains like Chase and Damon well, Savage. Well, it's like, and the, there's a, there's a, definitely a subtlety in how they're written. Because, um, the, the, the main bad guy, I, I know if you, if you've watched my, um, Skyfall video that I did that's three hours long, I discussed this. But the main bad guy in Skyfall, uh, uh, Mr. Silva, he is very much a villain Sue in that. And, you know, he's supposed to be this, like, genius hacker guy who's also an ex-agent, and he's also one step ahead of everyone, and he knows how, what they're going to do, and it's like, but he's so ahead of everyone that you're just like, I mean, how does this guy not even rule the world? And it's like, and it's so boring because, not, you know, he's just like, going to get away. not and, believable, yeah. and it, or whenever it's felt like it's very phoned in, like... It's like the thing that I loved about David Zanatos and like even Chase Young. He's like, it's not phoned in. You can see why they're three steps ahead of everyone. Like how they plan things out. And, and like, even when they fail, that they like, have And then it's like it kind of works in their like favor. That's, like, that, that's, why they, that's why the trope is named Xanatos Gambit. <laughs> yeah, my goodness. Like, it's like, you need to watch Gargoyles. You love it. I, I, did, watched, I watched Gargoyles when I was younger. If you oh, did. you did? Yeah. In okay. fact, I even had Gargoyles socks. But like, like the, but not it's, season it's, three though. Don't watch that one. Yeah, <laughs> just watch. Yeah, because the uh, first two were actually Greg, 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 Yeah, Greg Wiseman was kicked off of it for it. Disney did a big mistake with that. But oh, Greg Wiseman always gets screwed over. What the heck is it? Oh with, my god! He what the heck is with his shows not getting more than two seasons? It all and like I think like, that's the he's or, unlucky. He is so unlucky. Yeah, gargoyles. Uh, Spectacular Spider-Man Spider Spider and, and Young Justice. Justice. Like, this guy gets screwed over, poor thing. He's such a smart guy, too. You can tell he's a smart guy. Like, yeah. he's even that way, like, even with, like, Young Justice. Like, where he has these villains, like, they're smart villains. Like, they're always, like, even whenever, he, he, he does the same thing in Young Justice. Like, whenever even the heroes have a victory, but it turns out there's something. That there's something the, behind the scenes. Like, some behind the scenes. Or, like, the villains needed the heroes to win because of that would give them victory. It was just yeah. really, like... He yep. obviously knows how to write those well. Oh, and then Spectacular Spider-Man ended up on the most ridiculous cliffhanger, and then it got canceled, and you're just... And <laughs> Sounds you, like Young Justice. Yeah, and it's like... <laughs> but it's like... <laughs> and it, really yeah, yeah, you know, there's actually an episode of Spectacular Spider-Man, and it's like... And it's actually... A, it has a two stories going on of this, like, security system, and Spider-Man's stuck in this prison, while the there's a school play going on about Shakespeare, and it has all these Shakespeare quotes going on during the thing and it all just kind of melds together and you're like and you look at this and you're just like wow that's just really smart and you're like wow. he has this way of like no. mapping these stories out like it's like I wonder if he is Xanatos in real yeah. life because he like probably has this flow chart. He, he probably has this grandmaster plan to get revenge on all oh, these yeah. executives. He, yeah, he's probably there's those, like there's this plan now. They they, can, they canceled Young Justice, but they're playing right into my hand. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's my new head yeah. Like, but yeah, but Chase is exactly one of those mm. kinds of villains, and he was also fascinating because he cared nothing for Shin Gung Wu. The only reason mm. he'd ever go after it is because if he absolutely needed it, but you could tell he didn't like that he had to go after it. You could tell he kind of resented that if he actually Because he felt it. it was almost cheating. To... It's like, but he's like, because sometimes it's like, ugh, I have no other choice. Well, it's like, and I, I like how in sometimes, like, he would, like, in, in certain showdowns, he would come in and he would wager a Shang Gong Wu and then not use it. At all. Like, and he was like, I wager this, and then he's like, but I have no need for it. I know, it was... The only time I remember him using one, though, is uh, he was in a, a skill showdown with Omi and yeah, he used the Shroud of Shadows to cover up. Yeah, that was the only time I've ever seen him use one in a Shaolin showdown, like a Shen Gong Wu, which was really interesting. But it was funny because he was doing that on purpose. To test him. Well, not just to test him, yeah. but also to throw Omi's friends off because yeah. they didn't, he didn't like... Because Chase and Omi were developing a, a student-mentor yeah. relationship. And if and you want to hear about that, ask her. <laughs> <laughs> I might get into that pretty soon, actually. Yeah, you know, it was for, like, when I, we were talking over Skype, and it was, this is actually before I rewatched Shaolin and Showdown, and she literally, like, ran I for, went like, an hour. on and for, on about, and about, on. About uh, Chase and Omi's uh, relationship. And they, they fascinate me. They became, like, as I was saying earlier, they became my favorite characters. And I... I don't talk about it enough on my Tumblr, and I, I wonder why I don't, but Star Wars is like one of my favorite, favorite things mm -hmm. in life. I loved watching it as a kid, and I grew up with it. It was just one of my favorite things, and of course, as you like, my favorite, <laughs> my favorite characters and their relationship was Luke and Vader. 
was like, I always found it really fascinating because usually in most shows where there's a villain character and they're one, like a loved one, that's their one source of light. Like that could be their redeeming factor. Usually if it's like a male villain character, it's, it'll always be like a female. Like, yeah. a, like a girl that was like a romantic interest. That Love could redeems. Be, like that sort of thing. And I was like, what, what I love about Star Wars, it wasn't that. Instead it was his son. And so, like, that already like, made it more interesting to me yeah. that instead he redeemed himself for the sake of the love of a child. Yeah. Not, like, for, like, like the romance cliches that you'll see over and over because again. In fact, it, romance it, is what destroyed his... Yeah, if you watch episode three and then he ended up screwing his own... Because he loved her so much that it just, like... He was he, willing he to went betray crazy. all of his morals. He went crazy. And I was like, so it's really funny because of... It just like it. It fascinated me. Like, oh, it just well, fascinated me so much. And so I go into Showdown, which I didn't really pay much attention to it whenever I actually first watched it. Whenever it was like airing reruns on Cartoon Network. Yeah. So whenever I'm in college and I'm watching it, and I started to get fascinated. When I watched it the second time around, I really started to get fascinated because I started to notice more things. So then I started focusing more episodes just on them anytime where I'm like I would then just start rewatching episodes that has the both of them interacting mm. and the more I do it the more I start to pick up things they're very small very subtle and I'm just like wow like you need to keep watching and watching and watching mm -hmm. to see it it's like like a kid and it could like like if you're not paying attention it'll go right over your head but it's like it's very subtle about them mm. Omi and Chase are basically parallels to each other and um, they're they're basically yin and yang. I don't. It's uh, I didn't even had this post, but I was like, there's yeah, no coincidence. There's no coincidence that the yin and yeah. yang yo-yos were introduced in the season that Chase was introduced when they had the whole set. Yeah, the whole me. plan with that. And it's um, it's like their one misconception people have about yin and yang is that they are just literal opposites. That's the one thing that bothered me yeah. about the Zutara fandom. Is like they're not they're not literal opposites. It's literally things of balance. Like you get fire and water. They are not fire and water is not yin and yang. They cancel each other out. Yeah. Yin and yang. And one one will uh, is for the, to exist. One will have to overpower the other. Yeah, yin and yang is two seemingly opposing forces that are that are interdependent and interpersonal. They are balanced. They need each other. Like how. Light and shadow need each other. Like, shadow cannot exist without light. A light casts, like, on, a, on an object, a shadow is there. A shadow cannot exist without light. Those, they are interdependent and need each other. Or, like, uh, you could say, technically, like, um, air and water or air and fire. Be, those actually technically could be, which was like I found more interesting was like if you wanted to go with the yin and yang parallels and what yin and yang actually really means, Zuko and Aang actually fit yeah. that much better because they parallel each other quite well and like they're, but they also take different choices, different decisions, but they still mirror each other in a way and it's like air cannot exist, like well no, fire cannot exist without air. It's like it's and it air, needs, air, air, it needs air oxygen. Fuels fire. And air yes, and air fuels fire. Like it just like take a wildfire. Or like you have a spark somewhere, gust of wind and it just goes off. It's just like that's kind of what fascinates me about yin and yang. Like it's like I think a lot of people don't realize it. And that's what Chase and Omi are. It's like they are they they're very similar to each other. But they're also very different, and um, there, there's those little seeds of like direct similarities. But yes, like um, there, if you can obviously see, Chase is clearly the youngest of like the trio of Guan and Dashi. Like Chase is obviously the youngest. Chase is like this martial arts prodigy. He's very arrogant, and that's like one of his biggest weaknesses. That, that's What's what Omi's mean. weakness? He's arrogant. very arrogant, and they have this ego, and. Um, but they're they're pretty smart and they're very proud of um, like their tai chi and martial arts and um, they both uh, they're very honorable. They always keep to their word. It's like that's like like the most important thing to them. Like always keep the word, no matter what happens. Their yeah. word how yeah. has to yeah. be kept. Chase's sense of of honoring his word is so strong that even once he was turned evil through Lao Lumin's soup, that remained. That, that trait about him remained. Yes. And that just it fascinated me. And so it's like um, they're a constant reminder of what the other could be. Chase is like this dark reminder of what Omi could be if he ever let oh, his if ever let his jealousy and bitterness get to him. And he could make the same mistake as Chase and turn his back on his friends. So and then uh, 
Almi's basically a reminder of something that Chase once was and could become again. And if, if like, there's if always the implications that that there's know. still a little bit of good inside him because he does these things that's very contradictory to his evil nature, and even Omi has pointed it out. Like, like that was the, good of you. Or the the yeah, he every time something happens, he always uh, emphasizes that. Or like when uh, when Chase is like the evil in you is stronger than you know, and then Omi's like the good in you is stronger than you know. And if you look at the yin yang symbol, there is a little white dot in the black part and a little black dot in the white part. And I felt that line. Where where they say to each other, the evil you stronger than the good you stronger than you know, is a subtle reference to that. And I was like, and I thought that was really clever. And I was like, but if you think about Omi's like character and how much he gets me, because he's just this little child, and he's very much a child. And I kind of bugs me that some people hate on him when Omi. Okay, yeah, season three really flanderized Omi's character, and I will admit there was moments he was annoyed, but. He does get his comeuppance. He does, like, make mistakes and, like, gets punished for his mistakes. And, 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 and then the ultimate acceptance of Raimundo as the leader. Like, that was, like, he had such good character development, but he acts exactly how a child would act. And more importantly, you start to understand more about his nature. Suddenly, his rivalry with Raimundo, or whenever he was really jealous of Jermaine when Jermaine came in, started to make sense because of it's like kind of hinted at that Omi seems to get this feeling that if he's the best, he will be surrounded by people. And he's an orphan, so obviously he doesn't want to be alone. That's obviously a, something Omi's afraid of. Oh, and also the fact that so, well, before so the other So Jermaine came in, and Jermaine was doing better than Omi, and Raimundo sometimes is better than Omi. Like, that affects Omi. So it's like Omi is almost afraid of somebody replacing him. And it's mm -hmm. like, and if he's replaced, he's all alone, and nobody will want to be his friend anymore. And it's, yeah. like, it's like, that's, I think, one of Omi's biggest fears. And it's mm -hmm. like, it, it never outright states it, but it, there's always that implication there. And I was like, oh, that's really sad. It's like, so if you think about all these characters and their place in Omi's life, now obviously his friends are like siblings to him. There's even that whole episode of Omi Town, Omi realizing because he's an orphan, he just wants to know what it's like to have a family. And he, even though the monks are his family, they're basically they're basically his family when he comes to realize in the end. So it's like, but if you look at all these like characters and what they are to Omi, they're basically then you have those guys. They're basically like siblings to him, and you have Dojo. He's sort of like the fun funny, like, cowardly uncle, kind of like the one in The Mummy. He's ba that's basically Dojo's role to these kids. Yeah. He's basically the fun, funny, cowardly uncle to them. And he's just, he has a little f nice, cute friendship with them. And uh, you look at Fogg, he's like the, he's not only just their teacher, he's sort of like the wise grandpa. He's literally the wise old man. <laughs> he's like the wise old man, the grandpa, the Uncle Iroh, like, in a yes. way, like, to, like, this whole group. And he's just, like, there to give them advice and and riddles and whatnot and just help them like figure it out and he's the, he's their teacher and kind of like the wise grandfather figure in the family but then you have to realize there's something Mask. missing in that whole family picture that Omi has it's like let's see he's got a relative he's got a grandfather figure got and, and he sisters. got brothers and a sister and it's like what's missing the parental figure and that's the one thing Omi Town kind of focused on, the one thing Omi craves the most. So then you start to realize, when you look at Omi's interactions in Season 2, it starts to make sense why he was very... The closest thing Omi has to a father... Is Master Fung. Well, no, no, is uh, Chase Young. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, Master Fung is basically like the grandfather figure. He's not quite fatherly with Omi. He did. He did pretty much raise him. But he did pretty it's, much. It's like being raised by your grandfather. But it's basically that's what it is. Kind of like you see in some comic books, like these characters were raised basically by like, like Peter Parker. Yeah, Uncle Ben was like you know, but um, it was it just fascinated me because these two aren't related, but you can tell Chase sees himself in this little boy. And, like, it, probably for his own selfish, vain reasons, he sees himself as, and is, like, wants to make this boy in his own image. And it's like, but he still kind of sees himself in this little kid. And yes, he wants to turn him evil, but it's, like, in his own weird way, that's kind of caring about Omi. It's, like, especially when you watch time after time, you start to kind of see, like, how... There's this, like, really nice guy Chase once was. And he's, yeah. like, was actually, he still is this pretty cool guy. Like, it's like, I swear, no matter what yeah, incarnation, he's yeah. always a cool guy. Even if he's completely evil. <laughs> he's, like, evil or good, he's always this cool guy. But he, like, had this nice relationship with the monks. But you could almost see, it was, like, subtly hinted at that he kind of, 
like had like a closer relationship with Omi in that timeline. And like even with Omi, like like that big smile on his face when she said, sorry about that. We keep having a lot of technical difficulties tonight. Okay, so and then up so there's like it was just this very matter of factly way Chase says to Omi. Mm -hmm. He just like you just supposed to have some bump on the noggin, my good friend. And just like this like the way Omi just brightened up like the biggest smile possible and he gasped, was like, We are good friends like it's like you could tell, yeah. like from season two, that's something I think Omi wanted, but there was that confliction. And I think the new order, like, really, like, highlighted that, and that's why Chase, like, did that whole, like, deceit to throw the monks off to do those, so that they won't know that yeah. there is something, like, a relationship that is starting to develop between the two. And mm -hmm. Omi starts to feel very conflicted about that. He's a loyal kid, like the Bird of Paradise said, and I think it was that Omi's greatest quality is his loyalty. It's like yeah. Omi is loyal to a fault. Yeah, and that, yeah, even when uh, Chase uh, tricked him into uh, being his, evil, his, his he, minion, he, he, he was he was loyal to Chase. Because he, like, he gave like, his word. Even though that was his evil side, he still gave his word. That he, like, he's just like, yes, I'm going to be loyal. I will follow you. And it's like, there's like this confliction in Omi, though. You see he start to grow. Like, you can tell he's having this mentor-student, almost father-like son relationship grow with Chase. But at the same time... He's a bad guy. He's yeah. on the other side. And it's like there's he's his friends. So he's, evil. <laughs> he's, he's, he's being torn. He's being torn between two things that he wants. And and my dad's calling me. I'm still up here. <laughs> what the heck? I can't talk tonight about anything, everything. There's so many times. This is what happens when you talk about Chase and Omi. Nobody will let me have my fails. <laughs> Yeah. 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 All right. We're, we're we're in my dad's man cave, or as me and my siblings call it, the bat cave. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So there's like this whole confliction, and it just it fascinated me even more than Luke and Vader's relationship in Star Wars because these two are not blood related at all. Yeah. It's like that's what makes it so much more fascinating. Like just to have this these parallels and this mirror development. That's why I love Zuko and Aang's friendship. Yeah. Like they were so fascinating the way that they. They kind of mirrored each other. And they actually were related. Yeah, technically, yeah, they are. <laughs> if you like, would like you get down to it, it's like I love stuff like that where you have like a hero and a villain. Like, there's actually they're not so different. And it's like, but what's also is like Omi and Chase. They really respect each other. It's funny because you know he's he's like this young adult, like immortal young adult, and then you have this little like nine year old, like whatever. They're, he's they're, twenty pounds. That's all I remember. <laughs> this tiny little thing and I was like but they like really respect each other and it was just it's they're really fascinating to me they're just so fascinating to me I can go on and on and on and on and I did to him yes she has <laughs> multiple times <laughs> multiple actually occasions. it's like and you don't even want to get into my conversations with with Johnny and Karina because <laughs> we do that a lot don't we ladies <laughs> I actually got Karina so into it, and now she's got the exact same, like, my feeling. So anytime, like, I get that, I was like, Karina! And she's like, Aaron! And we're like, my feels! <laughs> we will have no... Donkey! But conversation <laughs> after conversation about those two. You and should see the messages, like, just the, the, like, the fan mail messages. It's just, like, so, all of them are, read more. <laughs> oh, though with, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I still need to do a post on that, but... Okay, so, we, so we the things, the, things that we covered, like character, interesting character relationship, remember that, because we're going to kind of kind of come back to that in another video. Yeah. We, there's things that another show kind of... We will not name this show. Scrapped, or didn't pay much attention to, or it doesn't give much detail to, or it, it just glosses over, or it just it doesn't completely, care. It completely misunderstands. Or, yeah, or just totally throws out the window and misunderstands or it does something else that spits in the face of it and it just frustrates me I don't even ask me about episode 14 don't <laughs> yeah oh I'll get to it later so I you'll hear it I didn't even make it yeah, yeah, through yeah, the first yeah, yeah, yeah. that's how this happened <laughs> episode 14 <laughs> yeah, I, that other show I didn't even make it to the first episode of that show. I didn't oh. even get to the Shaolin Showdown because I was so angry with how bad it was. 
I actually watched all three of the first three episodes, and I remember because he was like, "So what happened?" And I was like, "Oh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I could just like angry message after angry message. And he's like, "Wow, glad I didn't stick through it. Sorry that you had to." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and now we will stick through it. We Again. will. We're and gonna torture. do this whole fun little game because I think I remember after. I ranted to you about how much Chronicles made me so angry, and I made a Tumblr post, and I'm like, it's so great when you have a friend who can hate something <laughs> as equally as much yeah. as you do. And I was like, it's very fitting, is like, because we run this Legend of Korra critique blog, and I was we like, both we it was like our Korra. friendship is united under our hatred of something. <laughs> <laughs> United under hatred of poorly done sequel shows that completely mess up everything. Oh, that the original there's other stuff that we love too, and we will gush about and talk about forever at odds in. But literally, the reason we became friends is because I ran, I started up the comic horror yeah. blog, and I started talking to him because I saw his Stephanie Brown icon. I was like, oh, you love Stephanie yeah. Brown, blah, blah, blah. And I just offhand, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm the one who created comic horror blog. He's like, that was you. And then all of a sudden, that moment, like, we became best friends, yeah. like, right after. That and it was like, yeah, that show sucks. <laughs> then we found out we were both from Texas, and then we were like, yeah. Yeah, and then it's like, we both love Zelda. Yeah! And it was just like all these really funny yeah. things. And it was like, but hey, so people who say criticism and negative things, they can't birth anything good. Not so true. Our negativity to Korra birthed a friendship. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, yeah, so that's basically what our next video is going to be. We're going to mm. watch all the 14 episodes that are out, and we're going to tell you why we don't like it, and why there's all this and many reasons why mm. I can make bullet points that could go all the way around the world. But I won't. No. I will try to restrain myself. Yeah, so now we've talked to I will try to restrain myself. I can't, I can't go through many more sunglasses like that. <sighs> Dr. Aaron Banner, <laughs> an, expert in gamma, uh, an expert in gamma radiation. <laughs> I released the Kraken all over my poor sunglasses. Uh, so she released the Kraken. It was messy. Oh, my poor sunglasses. But yes, yeah, so we were very disappointed. He hasn't sat through it. I sat through, I think I got all the way up to 10 and I was just said, F it. Well, okay, I didn't say that, but I said, screw this. And uh, yeah. I couldn't anymore. But then I was like, oh, because people always are like, oh, watch it all the way through. Watch it all the way through. It might turn around. It might turn around. People said the same thing about The Legend of Korra, which were two seasons in. And it sucks. <laughs> but, it's like, but I was like, so, okay. So then I tuned into 14. And, um, well, yeah, you know how that song goes. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah. it... It so far has done nothing to prove that it's turned around, and even in the first, I'm pretty like, sure those minutes. episodes in between ten and fourteen aren't going to prove me otherwise. Yeah. And we're gonna sit through it, and he's gonna watch it, and I can guarantee we're not those people with our nostalgia goggles on too tight. Because we we've criticized parts of Shaolin Showdown too. Oh man, I I would I think I said it even somewhere in the video, or maybe I did not. I don't even remember because how many times this camera is like when the <laughs> battery died. But I could, was actually going to make a post. I was going to make a post. Criticizing. Cr criticizing the weak points of Shallon Showdown. But then just like, but, but despite all that, it's still a good show. I was like, but, you know, it's there's sure. these plot holes here and there that kind of really do bother me. And then Chronicles came out. And I was like, hmm, you so, know what? So, suddenly, the, sp the whole Spear of Guan thing just doesn't mean much. <laughs> it's, just, it's, just like, <laughs> it's like, suddenly that big, huge, gaping time plot hole and time after time... I can now, like, okay, you know what? It can be worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, now that we talked about that, let's talk about uh, the one thing that I wanted to do is talk about how we first found, when we were for our first, uh, what we thought about Chronicles before we watched it. Okay, yeah, so I saw this preview, and it turns out it was a leaked one, and it wasn't a final product, and I thought to myself, oh no. <laughs> it made me so worried. Because mm. I was like, I heard all these things, and it sounded like, even despite, like, the law, like, the copyright law thing, and the stupid thing that was if, going on between know, Disney it, and Warner it, Brothers. The, all the Shangong Wu couldn't be the same names, and even Because for some the stupid voices. reason, like, um, WB decided to keep the names of the Shangong Wu, and they're like, no, these are our copyrights, you can't have, what the, the, the 
So what? <sighs> and um, uh, and because of Canadian law reasons, because the show is like now being done in Canada, like the they only like voice actors from Canada and Tara Strong and uh, what's her Jennifer Hale. Yeah, yes, Jennifer Hale. Like they, they they actually were people from the original show. They're the only people who are actually Canadians. So, so no they of course they they're brought back and. Granted, I've seen some of the other voice actors, like the guy and the new guy that they got to voice Chase. He's done stuff like in Inuyasha and like other anime that I've watched. And he's not a bad voice actor. So when I remember when I saw that on like the Shaolin Wiki that he's going to take over, I was like, oh, okay, he's actually not a bad actor. He just gets stuck in a really crappily written character. Oh my gosh. And the line they make him say, and I was like... He's a good actor. Why are you giving him these stupid lines? Chase would not say that. You're going to hear a lot of that next video. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Like, uh, but, oh, man. I just, like, I was, I was like, fearful, but I was like, no, hold on the hole, hold on the hole. Mm. This, it's like, it's like, come on, it can't be as bad as Cora. <laughs> it's just as bad. <laughs> in some ways, it might be worse. In some ways, I just ah. Uh. Yeah. yeah, I remember the first time I had heard about it was um, I was on I was actually looking up episodes because you know sometimes I would find the, like episodes and then somehow I would end up with a dead end of episodes of Shell and Showdown. Then I would then I would find another account with it. And uh, there's this one thing I saw a thing about Shaolin Chronicles, and I heard about that, and I'm thinking, is this just um, the YouTube page for this? So I looked it up, and I heard, oh. There's actually going to be a sequel show to it. It was funny because there is a YouTube page. This person, their username originally, they were they like had like their headline because they have all the episodes. That's where right. I watched the stuff from, and I think I gave the link. Yeah, um, that's what I original, saw. Originally, their headline was Shell and Chronicles, and it's, Which I, makes I find sense. it I find it really funny because if you go to their main page now, suddenly that title disappeared. Yeah, and I was like, huh. I wonder if they watch the show and they're like, ah, oh, geez, no. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they took the title out. Like, well, I find their, name, their username is still, like, Shaolin Shodan. Like, like, and so I was like... I think it's a little ironic or a little odd that it was a strange coincidence that I happened to see that and then that's what got me to find out about the show. But, yeah. It was the Chronicles is what got me to start watching Shaolin Shodan. It's like, when I heard news of it, it's what got me to do it. Because I'm like, you know what? I want to see the show again. Like, because yeah. I haven't seen all the episodes. I want to see what this is all about. And school sucks right now. So I need something happy. Yeah. And yeah. then I see Chronicles. And I'm like, oh, gosh. Dang it, why? <laughs> like, but yeah. hey, it got me to rewatch Showdown. So, hey, there's a positive thing in it. Yeah. One positive thing. Yeah. And, you know, the first time I heard about that, I was like, oh, no, because Legend of Korra. And I'm like. Yeah, hey. he was like, he's like, I can't go through this again. I even remember that. I was like, well, like, there might be good stuff. I well, see some of the actors in this list. Well, and they're actually good actors. I know they're good actors. I remember I was, like, trying to be, like. Optimistic. I was trying to be optimistic so hard. And I was like, it might surprise us. It might surprise us. And I think we both were watching at the same time, and I'm just like, ah. Yeah, and it's like, and you know, I, I've seen so much stuff recently of them try to, like, bring stuff back and then fail miserably, and I'm just like, don't do it again. And it's so bad thinking. Yeah, yeah, but you know, now before I before I watched any of the show, I was I was like, no. So basically, I I kind of let off. And I'm like, I don't care. And then I looked into some of it, and I think I found the um the uh, character designs, and I thought, no, they're not that bad. You know, this is the basic character designs, and they're a monk uh, attire. And uh, but my first thought was. I will admit, I thought the attire was weird. I'm like, they look more like they're wearing sweats, like not Omi. Yeah. Like, like, Kimiko like, and like yeah, I mean, Raymundo, it, 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 they look like they were wearing something they got from Sports Academy. Yeah, I mean, I'm like, how are those Shaolin robes? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that was stupid stuff. So, but I mean, the way they looked, I'm like, okay, you know what? If they're gonna, if they have to redo it, I'm sure. It I looked guess, a little more streamlined though. Yeah, so yeah. the animation looks a little like more. Uh, what's the word for it? I guess you could say streamlined, cleaner, HD looking. Yeah, it's so, like it's, uh, it's got a shiny little coat to it. Yeah, and then I'm like, okay, I I mean, this could be worse, honestly. Um, so hey, then, could be Studio Parrot. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but, then, but then I saw Dojo, and I'm like, why the hell is Dojo yellow? Again, it's just like uh, if people were like, oh, that's just a small minor thing. It's funny because it mirrors exactly they. He is not the dojo we knew and love, and it's just like, 
Uh, there's so much. There's so much that... We'll, we'll get into that. And we're going to get into this whole thing. So if you are very, very, very pro Shaolin Chronicles and very pro like don't that one person who sent me hate mail, you don't watch the next video. <laughs> don't watch the next video because you're not going to be happy and you're probably going to send me more and I don't care. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. But um, yeah, the... if you are, if you were... There's like, there are some people who... They admit that there are faults, but still like it. Maybe you wouldn't mind tuning in either. And I was like, maybe you can understand where the very anti-crowd comes from. If you're interested in wearing the very anti-crowd comes from, the ones that aren't... Because not all of us are all, oh, nostalgia goggles. Like, I know there are fans like that. I know there are. And there are jerks who, like, will invade your tags and be, like, mean and say mean things. And they're blind only to their nostalgia and whatever every fandom has it yeah like uh, don't talk to me about pokemon i hate g waters <laughs> uh. i grew up on that stuff but i hate those kind of fans but um yeah it's like like most people who do not like shallon chronicles they're not like that they're not no. like like nostalgia goggle people. It's just like the same people, like the like, crit the criticism circles in Legend of Korra. It's like, it's like and like, people seem to think, oh, you're nostalgic. That's not it. You're the you're, they're the ones who have the nostalgia goggles. It's like you like like stop trying to find blind praise is what we're trying to say. It's like okay, when there's there now there's the circle who like still enjoy parts but will still admit faults. I am not blaming you because you are willing to admit faults. There are things I like that. Uh, are kind of dumb, like the Star Wars prequels or like the Transformers movies. Yes, I like the Michael Bay's movie, Eat Me. <laughs> but, okay. I like them too. I was like, yes, there's stuff that's dumb. Yes, there's stuff that has bad writing in it. It's like, there's fault. But I will admit that, and I still enjoy it. And I know there's some of you out there in the Shallon Chronicle fandom that are like that. So I know where you're coming from. I'm not here to attack you. We're not here to attack We're here you. to attack the show. It's like, we're not here to insult you and say your opinions are dumb. The only people we find are dumb is any, like, stupid, blind...